Welcome everyone to the last lecture of the semester, although uh, I will note that uh, Columbia World Project has invited Renzo Piano to speak on December 11th, so stay tuned about the event. It'll be up at the forum in Manhattanville. Um, it's really uh, amazing to realize that we're already in the final stretch of the year, and it's a wonderful pleasure to have Emmanuel Christ with us this evening to present the work of his practice Christ and Guntenbein to conclude this series this semester. Uh, as I reflected on this sense of time passing, it occurred to me that one could say uh, that the principal question Christ and Guntenbein explore through their body of work is in fact, maybe, architecture's fundamental engagement with the question of time. At a moment in which we are confronted with endless images floods of snippet content, seemingly unstoppable news tornadoes, and when it comes to architecture and the built environment, an acceleration of everything, from the time it's taking to urbanize the planet, to the time it takes to build a building, or even to the increasingly sped up and relentless space we are experiencing in practice. To imagine entering a Christian Gantenbein building is to imagine entering a different time a slower and maybe historical time of stability, certainty, care and thoughtfulness, care for the city fabric buildings are inserting, inserted to, into thoughtfulness about their insertion and the new urban conditions they create. The sense of powerful, confident presence is articulated through the sheer monumentality of the practice's bold forms, often entirely made of concrete which sit firmly in their context as iconic presence without spectacle. But upon closer look, the concrete's abstraction is suddenly undermined by the extreme attention to and breakdown of the material scale of their building surfaces. Whether playing with brick courses, inserting textured marble finishes, exquisitely turning corners, accentuating thresholds, expanding seams, or even inserting flickering lights, the work gain, gains its realism and its engagement with contemporary time through the practice's exploration of materiality in all its details, textures, rhythms, and scales. It is in this sense that the work stands out today uninterested by the techie gadgets and the green bells and whistles, as well as seemingly unbothered by our uncomfortable and yet prevalent sense that architecture should today constantly apologize for itself, Chris and Guntenbein's body of work reminds us that the ultimate sustainability for buildings should be their dur durability, as well as the contribution they could make to the preservation and expansion of the public realm of cities. This relation between architecture and the cities that give, them, give it rise is very much at the core of Chris's work, but also his research and teaching. At the Etaha in Zurich, where he and his partner have led research and design studios for almost 10 years and are now full professors, but also at other schools such as the Academia di Architectura in Madricio, the Oslo School of Architecture and Design, and more recently, the Harvard GSD. Faced with the questions of rapid urbanization and unprecedented growth, Christ asks how a new concept for an architecture of the city can in fact, if not resist, then at least contribute to the contemporary city through the reassertion of questions of scale, temporality, and form, as well as typological explorations, opening up new possibilities to think through questions of sustainability, density, and shared cultural and public spaces of exchange for the future. Founded in 1998, Kristen Guntenbein is today a team of 50 architects. They have won too many awards to list here, in particular for their Swiss National Museum in Zurich and the Kunstmuseum Basel. Current projects include a new housing development in Paris, a flexible office building in Germany, the Lindt and Sprungli, home of chocolate near Zurich, um, and the competition for the extension of the University Hospital in Zurich. In brief, their body of work is astonishingly expansive and mature for what is still a relatively young practice. We're excited to hear more. Please join me in welcoming Emmanuel Christ. Thank you, Amal, for this um, beautiful introduction. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for having me and for sharing uh, this moment with me. Um, actually, this introduction 
was so complete, probably I just showed the images and you just remember the text. But um, nevertheless, I try, I try to give my own version uh, of, of um, what I think is, uh, is um, relevant to our practice and to our teaching and research. Um, actually, recently I had a discussion with some of um, our students at ETH, ETH in Zurich. And it was a discussion about the role of the architect today and, and, and the, about the future of the profession. Something that, I mean, a question that we all share. It's not so easy to answer, but um, the question is, is evident. And, um, and strangely, this made me think of a photograph I came across a while ago. Um, the role of the architect. Uh, it is a wonderful picture of... Um, Lady, Lady Bird Johnson talking to uh, Nathaniel um, Owings, the far right, the man with the stick. Um, so uh, one of the partners of SOM, uh, explaining and showing the Washington Mall uh, master plan in 1966. It is a historic uh, picture. Today we live in different times. And we all think, luckily, we live in different times. Although thinking of uh, Washington DC, I'm not even that sure whether, luckily times are different, but that's another story and I'm a Swiss citizen, I'm not allowed to, to um, maybe comment on that. But I'm an architect as well and um, yes, the role of the architect has changed too. The architect is not the powerful ruler with the sticks or the stick in his hands anymore, I guess, and I think this is right so. So, but what is the role of the architect today? Or more generally speaking and asking, what is the impact of the discipline? What we all know and we read it in the newspapers and we, and we learn it here at the university and elsewhere, the impact of building is huge. Uh, in terms, and very relevant in terms of numbers, energy consumption, use of resources, we, we all share that concern and this awareness that the building sector has a major impact on what's happening with our planet. And there's a lot of construction going on, even in the old world as the US or um, in Europe. But under the pressure of commercial real estate development, the influence and the importance of the architect is fading. That's at least how I experience it in my rather European context. And we could say the influence of the academic architects and designers is minimal, is marginal. So then, still referring to the discussions with our students, and I would like to share it with you, um, we, we came to the conclusion we have to find new ideas for the profession and for the discipline of architecture and I think that's what we all do. We work on these big challenges of our times. You doing this here at Columbia, as much as we do it at ETH, and of course all our colleagues in so many other schools in the world, of course. Trying to address the challenges of the profession means uh, we come up, we develop new ideas on program, sociological, programs, but of course also on technical, sustainable solutions. Architecture has always been, and I think should continue to be, a technical, a technical discipline as well. To a certain extent, we have to be able to still understand and profoundly influence what we're doing with our technical means and possibilities. But there's probably more to achieve we also have to reconquer or redefine the field of form per se. Since architectural expression is a cultural and political project as well. So considering the impact of architecture, our discipline is to be understood as a discipline that has had a huge potential to affect not only the environment and the economy, but also the psychology 
and the behavior of a whole community. In other words, it has to do ultimately with democracy, for instance. Architecture can make a big difference to society by building something even relatively small. Because architecture not only has a practical, but also a symbolic and hence a political value. To still look at that beautiful, strange picture, that's why I'm interested even more than in the architect himself, uh, in what his stick is pointing at. The monument. The monument. Uh -huh. All of quote, I tell you who, it say, who said it. It's a quote, all of us are perfectly aware of the fact that monumentality is a dangerous affair in a time when most of the people do not even grasp the elementary requirements for a functional building. But we cannot close our eyes. Whether we want it or not, the problem of monumentality is lying ahead in the immediate future. All that can be done within the limits of our humble efforts is to point out dangers and possibilities. This was Siegfried Gideon in 1944, the need for a new mon monumentality. Let's see what we do with that. Hmm. It was an interesting moment, sort of, towards maybe the, sec the beginning of the second half of modernism, where first doubts and questions arose about the question of form, you could say, and its meaning and its symbolic value. Why is that? Because I think monuments raise the question of values. And, and this is interesting on a level of architectural theory, because monuments relate the idea, the depiction of value to the problem of architectural form. Here we see it again, the Washington Monument and the Mall. This was the March in Washington for Jobs and Freedom in 1963. It was uh, the date that marked the 100th anniversary of the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. And what is interesting in that picture is that the monument that stands for itself is becoming a place of reference. So the monu monument is creating or is becoming a social and political space itself, meaning that its value as a symbol is changing with time and history that it witnesses. The monument that was erected for a specific reason becomes through accumulation, through experience and witnesses, a place of collective memory. That's its cultural political value in very short, forgive me this slightly um, simple definitions. But what matters on that, pictures, and on that picture is the people as much as the architectural object, obviously. As we've heard already, the monument is also an architectural problem, so we can relate it to the question of form itself. And I am daring to say the monument is maybe the at least secret dream of almost every architect. And here Adolf Loos makes it very explicit in, in this famous drawing and famous um, design competition entry for, for um, the Chicago Tribune Tower. Even an ordinary office building can aspire for higher honors. And what does it stand for? I'm tempted to say it's a monument to the classical order of architecture itself. So the monumental form is the building, and the building is a monument to architecture. The problem of architectural form is monumentalized. Whereas there are other examples, Barnett Newman goes back behind laws to the archaic motives of the pyramid and the obelisk of the Washington Monument, 
but this time it is broken and put upside down. You probably all know that famous sculpture. Here it is depicted, I think, in the 1960s in front of the Seagram building here in New York City. There is another version, famous version of it in um, Houston in front of the Rothko Chapel. That was then the moment where the reproduction and the reinterpretation of classical forms um, was done in a very critical and at the same time very original manner. And of course it shows a very ambiguous relationship with the idea of a, of a monument, breaking the monumentality and through doing that or by doing that breaking the representation of traditional power. And this in a time of civil unrest the de Menil installed it then in Houston uh, as a dedication to Martin Luther King, for instance. Mm -hmm. And now the big question. What is a monument today? Are monuments still being built? And if so, what meaning, program, and form would they take on? Mm -hmm. This is a fair question. It's not so easy to answer, but that was the problem that we gave to our students, actually, not last year, the year before, two years ago at um, uh, the GSD. And I just saw at least one of the students, so um, I've never showed, shown that before, so let's see. But it was a very interesting experiment. The monument, the semester was called the monument, the task, a contemporary monument for Washington, D.C. So this, the aim of the studio was to design a contemporary version of a monument in a time where the collective, the expression of the public sphere, or more politically speaking, the value of democracy are called into question. And I show you now some projects um, rather quickly. The assignment was simple. The students were invited, and this is the most interesting part because that's addressing your generation our generation, but also the younger generation of the students, what do we, what do you consider relevant to be commemorated under a, in, in form of an architectural or type of architectural object that we would call a monument? And so uh, students were invited to find or come up with a headline from the then latest, I think, two to six months, and to identify an event or an occurrence that they considered relevant to be to be become a, or to be commemorated. Um, I show you just some slides. Here is we're back with laws on the left, and we see um, 1251 Avenue of the Americas, Americas here in New York. So uh, Emory Roth and Son building the gen I wouldn't say the generic, but the office, the high performing office tower as we know it from the post-war modern period here, it's the 1970s. Uh, so, this student was um, referring more generally to, to um, the economical, economical uh, crisis that happened actually a bit earlier and then to a headline that I don't remember, but it was the attempt, and that's why it's the opening example here, it was the attempt to very directly relate or combine um, these, these um, elements of Lowe's proposal. So a functional building that at the same time acts as a monument. How could we do that? And it starts with a huge foundation. You see sort of the base of a building, four big entrances, 32 lifts, elevators in the center. So this is a plan of a building. Above this ground floor, a huge obelisk is rising to the sky. You see the elevation and the section. And it's in the first place a building, but its form is a clear symbol. You recognize it, it's an obelisk, so it is not the column of laws and the celebration of classical order. It's going back to the Egyptian obelisk that is sort of reproduced in a bigger scale uh, 
in Washington in the mall. And the program here is an office tower, so that's boring. But at the same time, it is understood as a monument to capitalism, as the real value to the American society. That's the statement. So the criticism of a global economy that always aims for taller, bigger, and faster production. And we see here, there is also, um, here is the new obelisk. I think this is, um, this is New York, World Trade, World Trade Center. Um, we have another New York Tower, but um, I'm, I'm sorry, it's not so much New York anymore. Huh? It's, uh, this is a project for Mecca, this is Dubai, and so on. Huh? So a pretty tall tower. I think it is like 2,000 and something feet or 620 meters or so. Huh? And the idea was to put this huge object, this obelisk tower, into perspective. And this means into a relation, in a precise relation to the traditional institution and the representation of power. And that's what we see on the right-hand side. So this is the capital. Here is the mall. And the new tower stands outside the city center, because there's also regulation. You cannot go tall in Washington, D.C. So it's actually in the outskirts of the city, but the idea is simple, that the distance measured from the capital is, I think, four, roughly four times bigger than the distance to the, to the Washington Monument. So in order to keep the relationship or the, the, or the relation, the the height of the tower slash monument was also four times bigger. And that's how then the proportion was created. So it is dependent on the distance to the capital. It's further away, but it's taller. So it's sort of, that's the hypothesis, the same presence as the Washington Monument. Mm. Mm. And then this tower, I don't remember on what floor, had a observation deck like a slit in an armor. So it's a slightly scary piece of architecture. And that's now this view from the Capitol on the mall. On the horizon, you see this appearance. There is, um, is the monument standing scary and menace, uh, menacing. The dark power, the shadow, the counter image to the, ide the idealistic sign of an open democratic society. So this is what um, the monument is about. It's the dark power of capitalism. It's a simple story, forgive me. But um, I liked it a lot that, that uh, the actual obelisk is becoming uh, an office tower of, let's say, a global scale. And as I told you, it has to do it has to do with a political system that is based on a neoliberal political agenda, and that's what the student was referring to. Um, it was not the only project that was trying to understand what's, what are the values of, the today, of today's society, and that's not actually not only for the US, but uh, of course for Europe and many other countries uh, too, whether it's in, in the East or in the West, North or the South. Uh, Another consequence of this neo, uh, neoliberal agenda, political agenda, was, um, was the, the whole housing market that, as we know, ended as the subprime um, story. And the second project was um, referring to that. It was actually using, and that's very close to our design method, even as a practice and in our, in our um, design studio as well. It was literally using um, a series of typological references. And what you can see on this slide, uh, in axon and in plan, is a sort of a short um, uh, development or um, of, of, the American, of the American house. Uh, the brownstone and then freestanding suburban house, different types. It develops 
up to the or down to the Mac Mansion, that is then a, a, a version of a commercial prefab building. Uh, as you probably know, it's forming this huge mass of, of uh, buildings and constructions in the US. The object that is created is a composition of these different types. So this is the, the lowest, the, the, that's at the bottom, and then you would have a first, second, and so on floor, and at the very top, we see the McMansion. It's a sort of a mausoleum of Halicarnassos, but not for a king or something, but it's rather a piece of architecture that is trying to maybe remind us of the fragility of the real estate market. A beautiful construction, actually, that is using the tectonics of the balloon frame and building up a fantastic ghost house that takes a proper monumental position in the, in the, in the, in the urban plan of Washington, D.C. I think it, this is Pennsylvania Avenue. And on this square in front of the World Bank stands this object, this architecture, this uninhabited big house that is a collection of many houses. Architectural form is carrying a meaning. It stands for a symbolic value, a memento mori, to the existence of the house, not necessarily because it's a fragile construction in timber, but rather because the financing system behind or underneath is not stable. Uh, so the fragility expressed through form of architecture is, is um, visible in that beautiful object. How long will it last? We don't know. Perhaps it will even burn one day. So what then remains will be the ashes of the memory of the subprime crisis. A very simple and at the same time, I think, very, very rich and accomplished project. The studio was actually very much related to, to a current moment. Probably you remember two years ago, more or less. There was a big debate about a planned removal of a General Lee statue in Charlottesville, in Virginia. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, it is a equestrian statue of that General Robert E. Lee. Uh, he was the Confederacy's top general. And then in August 2017, there was a violent rally because white nationalists um, were, came to Charlottesville to protest um, the city's plan to remove that statue. And at the same time, there was a counter demonstration uh, which were there to oppose these protesters. Mm. So that was a very violent moment. You probably remember that. Mm. And this is the fundamental. And, and it was very interesting to see that, in that sense, a classical statue. So it's not so much architecture, but that the monument is still of a political relevance. What do we do? It's a, not a simple question to answer. Mm. And in this confrontation between white nationalists and their opponents, which basically was, were representatives of, of um, different minorities and also people who fought for, for a liberal understanding of, of society, um, this brought back the memory of Keisha Thomas. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, as you probably can read, uh, taken from a newspaper in the 1990s, 96. This lady, Keisha Thomas, in another confrontation between um, a, a rally or people of uh, Ku Klux Klan, uh, they, were, they were opposed, aggressed, stopped by, by a counter, by a counter um, group, so there was a fight. And this guy is, is uh, I think, uh, you could probably kind of read it. Uh, he, I don't remember. He was, he, he's, a, he's one of these um, nationalist racists, and he was attacked by these men around him. 
and there was Keisha Thomas, and he was almost about to be to get killed by the by, by the angry men around him. And Keisha was with her body protecting the enemy, you know? the the person that was aggressing her ex or putting in question, into question her existence amongst others in in American society. So a heroic, beautiful gesture that is very touching, and our student Philip, who is here, um, made this discovery or had this this um, this idea to go back to that moment in in recent Amer American history and decided to propose a monument to Keisha Thomas in Washington. And you can see, or probably a little bit, there is a soko, a plinth, and there is a horse. <laughs> and the architecture, that's what we're actually talking about. Its form, its expression is the message. It's a big roof protecting this statue. So the project is actually that the proud general on his horse from Charlottesville is taken to Washington, but it is protected slash hidden, transformed just by that gesture of the roof that is commemorating this beautiful gesture of, the, of, the, of this lady. And you see it in plan. And this is architecture. It's a structure. It's actually a very beautiful structure. And here you see the statue. Here it's visible, but it's also invisible at the same time. It's a structure made out of leaves and branches that is covering it. It's a sort of a vernacular architecture. And it's very prominent, prominently placed in the park in front of the White House. I show you another project sort of next door, still being in Washington. It's an intervention on the mall itself. The idea was, we can debate whether this is a monument, but that's ultimately what we will do anyway. So we will debate what is a monument. It's architecture. This is new homes for new people to the US. Uh, sort of the ultimate alter alternative project to the Great Border Wall uh, uh, to Mexico, for instance. So an idea of offering houses in the inner circle of the symbolic buildings that form something like the core of the American capital, the buildings along the mall. It's an urban, beautiful urban plan. I mean, the original plan. And then you see now the dark buildings. It's a sort of a urban intervention creating courtyards and buildings that are connecting these different existing monumental buildings. Mm. Bringing these people to the very core is a problematic operation. So to a certain extent, we could be critical and say this is almost like taking them to the circus. Or we could ask, isn't the mall and that place of these institutions is sort of a circus. But we could have a more noble idea and think of a campus, of a university, where originally in Jefferson's plan, it was this idea of the collective that is grouping people's houses where people live. So a very, I think, beautiful and, and simple gesture. Mm -hmm. And then when we go closer and we see these beautiful buildings, the museums, and in the center between the two, institutions of knowledge, education, and culture, we would have a big housing block that is maybe reminding us of collective housing at the beginning of the, of the 20th century. So what you see is that I think it's always possible. We shouldn't limit ourselves to that, but it's always interesting and very productive to go back to ancestors and precedents in architectural history. That's what we're doing with our students. That's also how we work. Um, as it has been said in the introduction, and most, mostly then also the given build, it, build fabric, actually, of a, of a city. And that's what they are doing here, too, with these um, red buildings between the white classicist buildings on the Washington Mall. 
there's another one that I briefly uh, show you. So that's very much to the brief of the studio. That was in the spring of the same year, Google's AlphaGo defeats world number one Go player. So the victory of artificial intelligence over the human brain. That is what was, by the way, mentioned several times by uh, the students as a, as, a, as a very decisive moment that we shouldn't forget about. The project is a big object on one of the big high, uh, over one of the big highways entering the center of Washington um, from the west. A triumphal arch to commemorate the victory of AI over the human brain and to remind us of the power and the danger of technology. So a very <laughs> simple um, uh, statement and also in a way a, quite a simple architectural construction. You see the highway here and you see the structure bridging the highway, creating that huge gate everybody has to pass as long as there are still cars driving. And it is actually a big data center, so it is a monument that takes on a very um, a clear function. And finally, that's the last um, student project I want to show you today. Um, it's another intervention close to the White House. This is the White House. Mm. It's actually the White House being turned into a variation of the Phalanstère. Uh, probably you know the famous utopian social architecture from the early 19th century in France. So a place, a building, a huge building that is able to incorporate a whole society, <coughs> conceptually speaking, so open to host and accommodate the weakest um, members of society as well. That's the idea of the student to transform the current president's home into a larger home um, for other people. It was actually proposed as a monument to the dreamers. So the, the DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, as you know, I just read it yesterday in the newspaper that this is um, actually expected that, uh, that the Supreme Court might call it off. Uh, which is another discussion, so it's still very, uh, a very um, actual and, and um, important thing. Anyway, so in the end, it is an attempt to use architecture to say more than just function and, and, um, and let's say, space. Uh, it, it is about the meaning, and this is one wing of this new extended White House. So what does all this now mean for our own or for my own work? It's a pretty, um, let's say, steep entry to, into a pro project presentation. Um, and I ask, obviously, with these, with these projects, can we, shall we build monuments? And um, my answer is yes. Let's build monuments. Every project, every building, whether it is a house, an office tower, or a public building, must be a monument. At least a symbol for something, a gesture that speaks to the people. And therefore, it has to use a language that is understandable. It is therefore not, and I consider that important, it's not the individual gesture of the egocentric architect, but it's rather the opposite, or it should try to be the opposite. Huh? Our, when I speak of this idea of a monumental project in all modesty, our project must take on a form that belongs to everyone. And this without using a style. So this statement is not a hidden neoclassicist manifesto. It is much more a manifesto for a common language in architecture, a common language that doesn't exist really. I'm dreaming of architecture that is intuitively understood 
and telling something that is speaking to everyone. So I would then relate it to the idea of architecture that is belonging to a place. Architecture, this project that we are imagining must incorporate a notion of time, memory and longevity. It must be appropriable by future generations in practical and symbolic terms. It must take a stand, a position to a society. It must be sustainable in material and immaterial terms. And to put that to the extreme, I would argue it must last more than 100 years. And um, this is a statement we made uh, in Venice, as you probably can, no, you can't really see. And this is a brick wall that is actually much older than 100 years. And there uh, we were presenting a big book, a monumental book, and just this light projection more than 100 years. There is also a small version of the book, and I flip through the book very quickly with you. Uh, it's actually a book about the project, so we are finally entering um, the projects that we've done so far. So not just my strange dreams about monuments of the future, but um, it's a book about the project, but it's also a book about how the problem of architectural form uh, um, uh, is, is um, behave, or how architectural form is behaving over time. Mm -hmm. There is a, a, a very short text. There are pictures by Stefano Graziani, who is a, a friend, uh, an architect and an artist, a photographer uh, from Italy, and there are drawings. It's about the Kunstmuseum in Basel. Uh, the text, that's all. Well, um, so this is a typical Swiss architect of my generation. There's not much time for writing. Um, but still, uh, uh, you, you, you see that there is, uh, in a nutshell, this, this um, statement of what I would call the sustainability of form. Uh, and the strive for long-lasting, to try to create long-lasting buildings. And this is a physical and material issue, but not only. It is also to be understood in immaterial terms. However, then the book is, is, um, takes that very literally. This is the interpretation of the artist who goes then to Rome, looks at the ruins of the Pantheon from the back, typically here, and is looking just at a, at a brick wall. Hmm? So form is created through remembering form, you could say, meaning that we are producing our images somehow always in relation to something we know. And this is not a new story. It's also a, a series of images that probably speak about the magnetic appeal of the ruin. There is other um, versions of that. And we are, of course, in a tradition where images of these ruins are part of the cultural propaganda, so it's, it goes beyond just your physical experience. It, it, it has to do with the fact that to all of us, I think, typically also in architecture schools, um, this knowledge, this romantic view on the ruin has been handed down from generation to generation. And then we probably see here the column, we see a different version of it by Borromini, in San Carlo alle Quattro Fontane. So we could say it speaks about the continuity of form and the problem of language. And a question that I find very interesting, and I was trying to refer not to classicism, but there's still a bit of classicism. Do, do buildings of different times speak different languages? It's an, interesting, it's an interesting question. The question is simple, the answer is not that easy. So there, it goes on. I, I won't explain every picture. Uh, that's a crate of an artwork, of a photograph by Günther Ferg, that is also a, um, a, <laughs> that is in the museum we've built. So far you don't see the museum, you just see Italy, you see brick walls, you see, you see kind of everlasting architecture through its sheer mass and massivity, and then the first image of our building. Probably would say this is now our reaction to the Roman wall. 
but I mean, it was Stefano who put the, created the order of the images. What is interesting, I was saying form is created by remembering form, but there is, of course, a certain abstraction. And then there is more of these details, and there's a second image on the right, beautiful work by Alghiero Boetti, and this is the, the artwork, and this is just a detail of a room in, in the museum building we did. I was speaking about the representation of that knowledge, uh, the, uh, another, a Piranesi. Ah, and then you see a bit more of the building and you see the urban context. And I was speaking about the monument that belongs to a place that is trying to belong to the place in the sense that people understand it is not um, about the creator, but rather about the circumstances. You could call it the context. Here we see the back of the building. It's an extension to, an, to, to a, to a pre-existing um, museum. So here in the back, you see a little bit of this museum. That's from the 1930s, and this is our building. And this is the part of a concourse in our building. Ah, and here we see, we're looking out of the new building. That's the entrance and loading bay area across the street. So actually, the two buildings are separate. They're just connected with an underground connection. And it is a lot about the dialogue between two buildings. And speaking of symbolic value, I think in that project, this dialogue, a coexistence, a cohabitation of two generations or several generations that are forming something like a community is uh, at the core of the, of the project. I call this project, and you can a little bit guess how it looks. It has solid walls. Amal was mentioning the threshold, so the care for the detail. And I would call it a contemporary version of a classical museum. And um, this is uh, meaning that there is, an, uh, there is an idea and an intention of appropriation or reinterpretation uh, of something that's already there. So trying to use the potential of inventing something out of a given. So it is not a completely new type of museum. It's rather the opposite. It's, a, it's something that, that exists already. Now we could question that and say, shouldn't we, shouldn't we come up with totally new ideas of museum? And um, I think nowadays the museum doesn't exist as such anymore. It, there are only very many different versions of a museum. Uh, I usually say after Centre Pompidou, there is that sort of the end point of, of the classical museum, and from then on you have like different versions, sorry, different versions of a museum. And this one is dedicated to painting collections in that traditional form. Hmm? Solidity of the material is celebrating galvanized steel and marble the brick, wall, the brick wall, meeting with a sort of a rather casual and informal context uh, uh, on the back. I was speaking about this ambition of overcoming the egocentric, the gesture of the egocentric architect. Mm. I said it should be rather the opposite. Our project must take on a form that belongs to everyone. That's probably, I hope, uh, uh, one version of how you could achieve that uh, with its physical relation to the human body on the left and to the surrounding um, city on the right. And here, finally, we see a little bit of the entrance. It's just the door. It's quite big, actually. And this is, uh, it's bricks, like in ancient Rome. What is a bit different is here is a frieze that is running all around the building. And in this frieze, that is between the layers of brick, there are LED lights that you don't see directly, but only indirectly. And then with a sensor that is measuring the, uh, the, the, the intensity of daylight on the facade, um, you would compensate um, the shadow that is created. So what we see in dark is the shadow just in the relief of the brickwork. And here, where we read something, it's the LED that is just kind of 
compensating the shadowing effect. So it's the attempt of creating a sophisticated presence of the digital age within that um, rather archaic brickwork. And on the right, that's the old building, actually. So you see, I was speaking about the dialogue. This is the new building in a series of these heavy, heavy <coughs> traditional palazzi along that um, street in Basel, where I actually live and work. And it goes on with this rather cryptic series of Stefano's photographs. You see the, the, the gallery space. You see a part of the wardrobe, and so on. You see the building as a cornerstone. If you look carefully, you see a bit of art here. This is um, a stainless steel box by Donald Judd. Hmm. And in the center is a stair. So that's the typological idea of the museum that we took over. It's the grand stair. Hmm. And it's the isolation of the wall. Another shot of the stairs. And then finally, we, ar we arrive to the third part of the book after the text and the photographs, we have the drawings. And the drawings show not only uh, a series of different spaces, but they also show that they are, um, this is the underground connection to the old building. That's the actual f f um, footprint of the, of, the, of the new museum. Mm. You see the geometry of the site. There is a street, and here is a street. And what you see here, or maybe the projection is not that good, but you can see that the construction, different from the ideas of a timeless architecture that is, stands in a tradition, construction is by definition anchored in the present. And it's all about the contemporary condition. So it's technical, it's economical. And what these drawings show in a certain contrast to the, to the photographs is that there is it's not about nostalgia. Eh? I see even a certain intended tension between the very specific condition of the here and the now, so expressed, for instance, in these mechanical drawings, and the idea of a piece of architecture that sort of stands there forever, that is trying to hide its contemporaneity. And then, of course, every project uh, finds its form not only by the, uh, through the context, but also through its typological um, inner order. And here you see it very clearly. It's two wings. This box is one wing with, with um, gallery buildings and this one, uh, galleries, and the other one is um, a compartment with four other galleries and the stairs in the middle and all the services in the remaining corners, to be simple. In section, you see celebrating the form of the tectonics. It's a prefabricated building, as you could see before. Four public floors. You even then see in this little book all the details of these prefabricated elements. So we spoke about that. We shouldn't give away the control over the building technology itself, even though we're speaking of symbolic value and a form and its meaning, I think in the end it is related to the expression of construction. The skylights, mm -hmm. the door, the windows, elements of the central stair, even the, the pre-stressed and not stressed cables in, in the load-bearing walls, and last but not least the brickwork and all the cables that are that are connecting the LED light sources in that facade. All the corners of the, of the brick that are creating this sort of mantle for the, for, the, for the whole building. And that's the LED sitting on the brick. So that's how the book ends with the legend and the list of all, of all the elements that you saw. Mm -hmm. So I tried to tell a story, a slightly cryptic story perhaps, of a building, and I wanted to tell you by using this format that the form of that building is engaging with the idea of time, or probably more precisely with the idea of continuity over time. 
So now I show you uh, another project, a totally different project. It's in Germany on a, on a modern campus from the 1950s where there are production plants for um, pharmaceutical industry, but also some, some office and, and, um, and uh, other buildings of, of that site. And what you see is this, is this building. It's an office building. Is it a monument to be discussed? It exposes structure and order, the principle of tectonics in a very, in a very blunt and, um, and um, let's say almost schematic manner. What we see is a very fragile columns and then the juxtaposition of these massive uh, monolithic uh, concrete slab and white concrete. We could say it is probably a monument to architecture itself or to a happy modernism, uh, to the principles of modernisms. The plan, there is one feature that is special. You have cores, you have columns. That's the glass, the windows. And here it turns the corner, and this little part here remains empty. So part of the building is an outside space. And that's where it becomes specific. The most generic principle of architecture, just the, the, the piling up of slabs, is put into question here. The slab is actually becoming a ramp. <laughs> and it's a little bit of empty space. That's the face to that side, to that campus. Mm -hmm. So the monumentality of structure and space is celebrated in that very moment. Mm -hmm. What you see is in white, that's the structure, and the decorative system of the floor of the floor is just celebrating the open plan of a modern building. So it is animating the movement uh, within that clearly defined space that you see in these pictures. So that's actually, uh, it's not a recent project. We are building actually a new building next, next to this one. And um, next time I come, I will show you um, what type of monument this will be. I said we should strive to build m monuments. And I also said it doesn't depend on the function and the size of the building, whether we um, manage to, to um, achieve that. And uh, this is a very small project. This is just a box in a garden. And of course, it will be easy for Anna to um, maybe question the monumentality of such a small building. Yeah. But at least it's a symmetrical drawing, and it is um, celebrating the tools of our profession. It's just the plan, or generally speaking, the drawing. And when you look at the plan, it's actually a guest house. Yeah. It's a very modest program. There is an entrance with a small kitchenette, and there's this is a room to the left and one to the right. They have the same size. There is a, is a wall containing some of the piping and the mechanical technical installations. And there is a small um, bathroom on the back. But then you start to understand that most of these walls would move. So within this very clear, slightly uh, probably boring um, floor plan, you see that there is a, um, a potential movement. So clarity versus unclarity or ambiguity within, within the clear, clear order of the plan. And the only thing that is not symmetrical is the entrance door. So yes, I think it is a monument. Because through its form, it strives to give dignity to this very modest program of a guest house or a, 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 small, a small housing unit in a garden. It's a freestanding building, so you could say it is, it is not, um, it's not a typical building w which you would um, use to build a whole city, at least not in my understanding. It's a suburban program, but even the suburban house um, can speak about, about 
this presence of the architectural form. Sorry. Mm? Uh. It's a composition of architectural elements. It's about the scale. This is the entrance door. That's the shutters. So actually, it is a house and an abstract box at the same time. It's covered with roof felt. And that's like a garment. It's like a tail made around the house. And here you see it in the context of, the, of these plants. I was speaking about the dialogue and the question of con formal continuity, creating forms by mem remembering a uh, form. This is in the same garden, another 150 year old pavilion. So somehow the box is not only a box, it's also a pavilion. It is also something like a piece of traditional architecture, if there is such a thing. Yeah. And it is a series of spaces. Even though you remember the plan, since the panels would open, you create the continuity of spaces. And this is from one room through the bathroom into the other room. It was actually used for an old gentleman who would then give up his home uh, on the other side of the garden and just take a, a little bit of, of his furniture and to live here. Um, in this, in this small but I think at the same time generous house. And what you see with this, with this photograph, uh, architecture is an accumulation of different layers. And of course, this is a metaphor for culture in general and also for life when you see all these different objects mm, that are co collected within that box. Mm. The box that is maybe the small monument to just the human, the human life and the home. In the end, it's about this, what you see inside. I show you a last project, another box, probably another monument, I'm not sure. It's a project for a chocolate factory. <laughs> um, so this is a, a, a quite an idyllic a depiction of the Lind und Sprüngli chocolate factory on the lake of Zurich, so again in Switzerland. This factory still exists. There are some more buildings nowadays for the factory itself, so it grew over time, but also the village, the town around, of course, developed as well. Here we see the site. This is a typical um, competition model as we use it in Switzerland. It's a plaster model, scale 1 to 500. So it's sort of the urban scale that is more a volumetric scale. It's the physical environment of a, for, for a project. Here we see the old factory that we saw before. It has been added here. There is a warehouse from the 1950s. This is a main office building. So that's sort of the new face of, of that whole institution that is called Lind und Sprüngli. It's a global um, chocolate manufacturer or producer. And this is a new building. So actually in the back, uh, it's, not a, it's not a very, it's not a very um, spectacular site. And what you see is it's a box. Uh, these are all boxes. It's a box. There is one element that is different. This is this sort of circular cutout that is creating something like a space here. So it's an urbanistic intervention in a small scale for that factory compound. And here is the entrance to that new building that is a public building or sort of a public building within the factory. It's a museum for chocolate. It's a shop. It is a it's demonstration plant. So they are producing chocolate there. And people could visit and they could make chocolate and taste chocolate and buy chocolate, but it's also a, a, the place where they would pre, um, research and develop new, new types of chocolate. Don't ask me why this is needed, but that's back to capitalism. I think the old Linton Sprüngli chocolate is fantastic, but they are surprising us all the time with new types of chocolate. So they have a bit the same problem as we architects have. 
why do we and what do we produce um, every day and how, how do we um, um, come up with something that's even better than the previous one. Anyhow, this is more an anecdotic remark. This is the plan. So this is the box. I said it is a, it's a museum. And in that sense, it's a very contemporary version of a museum, totally different from Basel. And Basel, what I call the contemporary version of a classical museum, this sort of a box or a building, a palace almost, containing very precious goods. Huh? Rather an uh, introverted building is Basel, also this one, because this, uh, it, it is um, a museum nowadays doesn't necessarily need light, for instance, daylight. Huh? That's the paradoxical thing. So I'm tempted to say a public building nowadays is a building that has no windows. Huh? Because when you work and when you live there, you would eventually use daylight. A mall, cinemas don't exist really anymore, but theaters probably, concert halls, museums, they don't have windows. So strangely, a closed building is a public building. There is some other, of, at a university, if we could call it a public place, there are windows, yes. Educational buildings, they do have. But there is, there is the problem of the public building that has no windows. And in the old days, and you see that here on the campus in Columbia and McKimmit and White and so, they knew exactly how to deal with the box. Eh? And they put columns and colonnades and uh, colonnades and, and, and a whole system of decoration that would also speak about the content of the building eventually. That's not the case anymore. So how, how do we deal with this sort of box? Eh? Anyway, this is um, the museum. It's. It, it's basically an atrium. It has a big atrium. Here, that's the chocolate factory part. So here you see there is chocolate produced. And here, this is the museum telling, telling the history and, and the culture of chocolate. And you can taste it and see. And it's explained how, how this, and this is a black box. This is all an introverted kind of a virtual world almost with some examples of, of um, um, chocolate as well. And here we have all the technical and um, logistical spaces that are related to, to, the, to the production of chocolate. The floor above, you would have restaurants or clubs and, and, and offices, and in the ground floor there is a big shop and a cafe and so on. And this is the square, or the, 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 the public space, surrounded by, by the factory buildings. And so here we enter, and then you enter this space. It's a very multifunctional building. It's a mall, ultimately. And this is interesting because it brings me back to the question of um, how, do we, how do we conceive architecture in order to make it last? Because use changes over time. So what stays there is ultimately the structure. At least that's the argument here. And what you see is a series of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 load-bearing elements, plus the contour, the, the wall with its fire or back-of-house staircases that are part of the load-bearing system. And all the rest is actually open with the atrium, as I said, in the middle. And this is um, a, quite an engineered building. So the architectural form, the idea of this structure that is solid, that is lasting over time, is, um, is expressed um, very strongly by the structure itself. It's actually, this is indicated here, it's a huge mushroom structure. So there's quite a bit of engineering. The type is clear. The order of the, of the structural elements is not that clear, though. So again, there is an attempt of creating a certain tension, and through that, an attempt of giving presence to the few architectural elements that belong to the building. I like these drawings. I don't know what they show, but um, they show, um, I mean, the calculations of, of um, the the reinforcement steel and, and the, the deformation of the concrete slab, actually. Uh, so I, I was um, mentioning twice that architecture 
is a cultural and a political discipline, but I was also mentioning twice that at the same time it is a technical, technological discipline. Hmm? So that's the structural engineering uh, engineer's plan or a, or a section of it, and that's what we then built. Uh, it's uh, taken from uh, the construction site, as you can see, that's the base build. And I mean, given all the effort and all the resources that we use, we better make sure that the building can last. And I'm, I'm saying that here proudly. Let's, and nobody knows what, what's in, in 50 years. You will find out, me probably not. But this is a, another monumental dimension to our profession, that we are conceiving and producing things that are meant to last longer than we live. I mean, this is a very general thing to design, or you could also say, in the arts or in many other disciplines as well, but what I find again and again shocking and encouraging at the same time is that we are that we are confronted with a problem or an assignment that is putting us into the position of of creating something that is living longer than we do. I mean, that is um, uh, that is uh, remaining and. Um, and this is this atrium. You could call it an archaic type. Yeah. It could make us think of ancient Rome, but also of the department stores of the beginning of the last century. A robust, a robust structure. It could change. It could become a workshop, a f complete factory. It could become uh, the whole thing a museum, the whole thing a shop, a warehouse. But you see, oops, sorry. Um, in the end, it is, it is at least in this stage showing the elementary presence of, of the architectural order. And in that sense, as you saw, the Piranesi ruin, it, we could compare it to that. And that's another long story how, how we, um, what we, what we learn about the ruin. And it's, monumental value. But what's interesting is when we speak about monuments, we very often mean old buildings. Eh? So a question that I have for the discussion, and it's a question to myself, is is just the fact that a building lasts over time or just remains there because people forget about it, does it make it a monument? It's just the accumulation of time and through that the memories that are encapsulated in that time? Is this making uh, a, a monument out of every building? This is just a question aside. So we see some more of these beautiful photographs of this impressive, slightly dramatic um, space. You see, or you, we could imagine, uh, and this is of course not the case yet, but how people then would walk through that building and go up in the museum and then maybe see the production on the other side. You see some more being lifted up and brought down, almost processed a little bit like chocolate. Huh? You see the soft lines or the soft movements of the concrete, of the heavy concrete. But it's a poor material in a way, and this forgive me the simplicity of the comparison, but I, uh, or maybe I don't have to say it. Huh? Did you think of the comparison between Chocolate and concrete, maybe not. Okay, uh, and this is a, this is the model. Yeah. So I was showing you the technical drawings. I also show you the models how we work. So we, that's just to give you. You saw the students' models. We build um, big models, sometimes rather clumsy models, where we try to understand the proportion and the spatial quality, namely, of, of, our, of our project. And this is very recent photographs, and it still like, takes another half a year until it's open. And so you have to imagine there will be a, a monumental, monumental chocolate fountain built in the center. And, um, and, uh, and a lot of things will come. And now it's very empty, and it, it looks almost um, like SOMs. <laughs> architecture of the 1960s, so um, I, I wasn't aware of that, but it, re it reminds me a bit of the first photograph you saw an hour ago. Um, I mean, that time. <laughs> but I think it's quite the beautiful, that's the offices. That's just very recent, that's fresh. I think I'm not even really allowed to show these uh, pictures, so please. Um, uh, 
So here, here you can guess a little. I'm standing here at the entrance of, of the museum part, and this is not lit yet, but here then will be chocolate processed, and a lot of people, Lind and Sprüngl is expecting it to become the most visited building of Switzerland, probably. I find that a bit embarrassing and scary, because the, we have some really good cultural um, buildings, too. Um, but not as, m as many people will go there as will go to the mountains. Uh, there's, this, there's still something more important, I'm glad. Ah, ah here you see a freaky floor. You can imagine the movement uh, up, and then you go along, and you cross on a bridge, and you walk along the process of chocolate production. You eat chocolate, and then you come back, and then here is the chocolate fountain. And then, you, of course, you can also buy chocolate. Wow. Yeah. From the outside, I was describing the site. So this is, um, the, I think, the second last picture. It's a bit less spectacular. It's a very, it's a, it's a very mundane, normal place. Uh, these are these grown over time buildings. Here we can see, actually, this curved wall. It's a brick box, red brick. And then there is this white screen. This is the entrance. Is it a symbol? That's a question. Hmm? But you see, eh? it's really a box. And then we have these gilded letters that sit on the frieze. They slightly disturb, let's say, the architectural order. Hmm? But it's an interesting question. How do you brand a building? Do you give it a name? And so the monumental gesture of the entrance screen is literally overwritten <laughs> or overruled by the letters of the brand. And I'm afraid, I must admit, the monument ultimately turns into a, a decorated shed. And um, so most confusingly, um, I end with this. Yeah. The monument, as we learned from Bob Venturi, is nothing else than a sign. Yeah. It's just words, <laughs> ideally. So is all my, all my um, attempt to give that much importance to architectural form sort of outruled? I don't know. It was Victor Hugo, no, who said, uh, ceci tuera cela. Uh, and that's where I end. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Emmanuel. It has been a really impressive um, introduction. Um, I really enjoy it, uh, basically because it's quite rare to, to, to attend to lectures that base their discourse on students' work. And I think that that's extremely meaningful. And I also really enjoyed the way that you end the lecture, because it was actually one of my questions that I had tonight, at least one of my references that I wanted to uh, throw on the table. Because it's quite, uh, you, today you have just talked about one of your, your books, but uh, you have published many of them. Somehow your work in academia as well as your little books that you um, publish once in a while, uh, for you are tools to raise a discourse that able um, you to define your practice, or in other words, you define, you position your practice in the disciplines through those little exercises, studio work and little publishing um, book, books, with short texts, true, but uh, quite deep, or at least strong. And uh, the first one, for instance, the one that you publish um, with uh, photographs of your travel to Rome, for me, it was, it's quite interesting to see the evolution of all those books. So you start talking about The Ordinary. His first book, for those that you are not acquainted with it, is just a collection of photographs that you pair really well-known architectures with totally ordinary um, architectures. And some of them, you pair them with your own work. Already, they're showing, positioning yourself with both ordinary and extraordinary buildings. And one of, then you move on from the ordinary, you move to typology. And then today you're talking about monuments. 
And in the meantime, you talk about time. So for me, the evolution is quite interesting. Um, and, uh, but today I wanted to talk about the ordinary, and also because we have in the audience uh, Enrique Walker, so I'm gonna actually quote you or use some of your ideas tonight. Uh, because it's, uh, one of your books is actually titled Typology, Hong Kong, Rome, New York, Buenos Aires. Some, somehow it could be linked with all these genealogy of architects that have looked to cities to raise a manifesto. I don't know if I could use this term here tonight. Uh, but basically to, to understand the capacity of the act of looking to a city in particular to raise a particular a personal project. And you have, yet, you have done that. And the question is always, what do you respond to through that look into the ordinary? So for instance, learning from Las Vegas, and actually we had a fantastic uh, reference as an end of this uh, lecture. So clearly responses to the design principles of modern movement. So it's clearly a response to the established idea that form follows function, claiming that form should also embrace ornament and decor, and through the case of the duck and the shed, uh, they came up with um, a new building type that would offer you know, a, a new kind of uh, lease to functionalism. So clearly we understand the position of, of uh, Dennis Scott Brown and, and Bentry towards uh, modern movement. But then my question tonight to you is, what do you respond to? Why do you think that today we should talk about monuments? Who are you talking to? Who I'm talking to? Are you talking to me? No, I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> um, uh, uh, you know, probably in a in a lecture, you always talk a little bit to yourself, or at least. Or, but that's just put that aside. I'm talk, I'm talking to to um, to not only my generation, but I think uh, probably rather to to the generation of of our students, of of uh, part of the audience here, and to our students uh, also in Switzerland. That I'm I'm sort of responding to uh, certain, let's say, to, to maybe a, a generation of architects who don't know anymore where the profession will lead them to. And uh, that's, not, that's not just the young students, that's also, as I said, to a certain extent, it's, it's, my, uh, it's also my own generation. It's me, you know. I mean, we are we are at the moment. Uh, we had a conversation um, and a discussion, Amal and I, uh, just also before. No, where we we're saying. I mean, we are this threshold generation. We were brought up in the 20th century, and it's our predecessors is the the generation of star architects, in all different manners, and. Um, and now, and now we are in a certain crisis. We we know that there is huge challenges, environmental, societal, digital and computation. How does it affect? We saw artificial intelligence. How does it affect us as a profession, as a discipline? And more concretely speaking, let's say, assuming I'm a young student, I'm investing all this time and this effort. What will my role be? And perhaps to come back to you, the question, responding to this imagined and sent uncertainty uh, to address probably the, the most radical aspect of architecture that is ultimately form, because form making is something that happens. It's not the reason to do architecture. Eh? I don't want to limit it to the problem of form, eh? but to try to understand that there is as I try to say, a social and political and cultural value in architecture, and that our, our responsibility as educated people, as citizens, is something we can express through architecture. Uh, and I, in my project, it's very modest. I mean, it's, by, by the way, the first project is um, the museum in Basel. It's just saying, I'm a museum. I'm not an iconic object that is there to be just promoted as an independent image. I'm belonging to the city. I'm part of that urban community. So it is a statement. It is a statement that says, yes, I'm 
addressing and accepting a certain context that I consider valuable to be reinforced, you know. I'm belonging to a place, as I try to say. But this is, this is something we have to be aware of. This is something no computer, no technology, um, no, let's say, political short time um, de um, defined political agenda would, would, really, would really tell you. So um, the monument is in the end the ultimate problem of architecture, I think. Hmm? And this is something we have to reconquer and re reinvent again and again. I'm, there's, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure um, whether whether this is um, an answer to your question. But I'm, I'm trying to give confidence and also an encouragement, but not necessarily an easy indication to where we should go as a profession. We should incorporate all that and, and um, what, what our discipline is defining, the technological, the econ economical, and the social aspects, and try to consolidate it under the problem of the form. That's what I think. Thank you. Thank you for, the, uh, for uh, making architects think. I'm not sure whether it's about profession or about generation, but it is certainly about architecture. And do you, uh, interestingly enough, uh, use Adolf Loos and Piranesi as cornerstones of your talk? And then you bring uh, Venturi, and then I thought, why not Rossi? And uh, in this redefinition, Rossi talked about the architecture of the city, and tried to do something that I hate, or I'd like to say, you're better at doing than he was. Uh, and in other words, trying to define a definition, to, uh, to, you know, how can I say def defining a definition? But to define uh, an architecture that becomes a different form of interiority. What struck me in terms of what you showed us was that even the building on the wall, on the, on the screen, uh, it's really turning like a glove inside out. You talk about a new form of interiority which we haven't heard for a long, long time. And so I'd like to hear from you about that. <laughs> a form of interiority. In the in the, I, I have to probably. To, I mean, thank you for for your comment and and also for the question. But um, so I have to ask back when you speak about interiority, you you mean um, the interiority of of um, the architectural artifact or of of um, interiority of of the person that sees and, and no no no. I'm talking only about the architectural yes. artifact. I don't mind about your subjectivity, that's fine. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, 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 about the purely the architectural artifact. In other words, um, uh, the role of the wall uh, and uh, its uh, references, and again, okay. you know, uh, uh, Piranesi and the images and so on. Uh, but uh, so there is a sort of defense mechanism, almost like a, um, uh, a military architecture of sorts. And then inside, it becomes incredibly sophisticated and even luscious. And so uh, this is something which in the sort of dialectic or the opposition between this inside and the outside, it's an architectural discourse in itself. And I thought that was quite no, fascinating. No. Yeah, no, no, uh, I mean, as I try to say, especially when it comes to, but not, yeah, in general, isn't, I mean, I gave whole lectures about the wall. You're totally right, uh, because I mean, it's not the only, but it's one of the fundamental gesture in architecture, as as we probably all know. And it's true that in in um, in a context that is that is a loose collection of individual gesture of all sorts, combined with a with a, and I. 
yes, I speak briefly about the human beings uh, using information and, 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 and our tools and, and everything so that there is that, I mean, carefully and, and, and greatly described by all sorts of philosophers and sociologists and architects and uh, theoreticians. But, I mean, the tendency towards the sort of a, a certain, I mean, every, everywhere and everything becomes the same and very simple. So the gesture of the, the limitation of creating the threshold <laughs> and the notion of, of walking through a door or under, under a big white wall or just opening the panel of that box and entering is, is probably uh, one of the most immediate and strong, strongest experiences that you can create in, in, an, in, in our daily spatial experience. If we try to understand when we move, huh? am I inside, outside, where am I, you know, this kind of, to intensify that moment of transition, of entering, going in, experiencing the lights going, that's very fundamental, but that's what our buildings are doing, and it's true, and in, all in different ways. And sometimes they are very protective, you could also say, I mean, I'm, there are, by the way, also doubts about these strong gestures. I'm very open. And sometimes you think it's maybe a bit too introverted. Should the building, you know, and I, I mean, <laughs> it's a bit simple, but especially in the post-war modern discourse, not in theory, but more in practice and in politics, you would say um, an, open, an open building is a glass building. Mm -hmm. And glass is transparent. We could argue about that. Maybe glass is not that transparent, but it's transparent, symbolically speaking, and therefore it is democratic. And then following this assumption, a brick wall with no windows is bad. It's maybe totalitarian. You know, it's, it's, so speaking of symbols and monuments, it's a very interesting question. So interiority and the threshold or the separation between two different conditions and offering a very precise relationship, which is maybe just a punched hole or a slit or a door or a gateway, is, is, um, is, is, is of course a symbolic gesture as well. And um, yes, our projects, our projects, they, they are in that sense maybe inclusive, but, um, but uh, not to the extent that they try, to, that they try to, to sort of overcome this idea of separation. And by the way, the box that you saw in the garden, before I designed that, I came to New York and saw the glass house by Philip Johnson. So um, I don't know. <laughs> it's more for the anecdotic um, part of that. Yes. Mm. Um, I'm going to close this talk by answering your question. Um, oh, yes, please. <laughs> Because you actually ask, is it the accumulation of time that defines a monument? And uh, of course, I mean, I think that you ask uh, knowing that the answer is easy because it's a yes, of course, but not necessarily. Um, I was, I, I thought that today, of course, you were, we, we had to talk about the famous uh, Regal book from 1903, uh, the, the modern cult of, of the monument that uh, clearly, at that time already, in 1903, so we're talking about a long time ago, um, there was already this um, kind of interest towards the definition of, of the monument from the, the modern um, perspective. And, and Regal clearly stages three types of monuments. Uh, the intentional monument, so the monument that is built to commemorate a value, probably most of the, uh, the exercise that you have shown today uh, from your students. Uh, then the unintentional monument, so that monument that is basically turned a monument through the people that provides a value to that. Architecture was not intentionally built as a monument. Then there's the age value monument, that is the, uh, clearly the one that answers to your question. Yes, of course, when we have an architecture that holds time, physically speaking, is therefore immediately uh, has a value because it contains physical time and time for us as humans it has a value, but I would say that your architecture or what you have proposed tonight is another type of monument that it's not that physically materi your materials contain time, but rather 
they contain time, metaphysically speaking, through form. So by linking formally the buildings with other architectures, so the act of using references, um, clearly form acts as a temporal symbol able to recall previous times. And I think that that's why you're proposing, you have proposed tonight this fourth type of, of monument that at the end where you do is through the transgression of those references, you're talking about the now, but at the same time about previous times. Uh, I wanted to thank Emmanuel for this fantastic lecture as well. And, um, but the interest of the monument is the production of meaning. Uh, right, and I think meaning, like program, shifts. I mean, glass used to be a uh, signifier of transparency, and now it has become the signifier of gated, you know, office buildings. And I mean, you just go uptown to the new campus, and you see the the sign of openness, which is actually completely about the opposite. Um, and so, I wanted to maybe tie this question of meaning to the question of place, because at some point you make the point that ultimately it is about place and continuity. Uh, and I keep repeating myself, it's been five years of lectures, and every time, I mean, we had Liz Diller last week, and um, there's a sense that the most um, still, and I don't mean to be so um, kind of reductive, but uh, you know, the most powerful architectural practices are very still embedded in place because that is where you can still produce meaning that you, op you know, you're operating almost with a kind of intuitive sense or, so what is, and you, you yourself mentioned place, and so I just wanted to maybe kind of end or on this note of, you know, embed, you know, in the end, this star architect model of a, the global architect attempting to, um, failing to produce meaning uh, across the globe, uh, you know, is something that we also have um, to deal with somehow. These were the, the two um, missing conclusions in my talk. I'm very, very, very glad that um, I could stimulate this, this, um, this discussion or these short notes. And um, yes, uh, so thank you, thank you very much. Or do you want me to know? I mean, everything is to be continued. To be continued. No, thank you, thank you very much. To be continued. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>